Well, good morning. If you'll make your way back to the book of Ephesians, this morning we're going to pick up in chapter 4, in verse 11. We've been making our way verse by verse through the book of Ephesians. And last week, we were actually only able to look at the first part of the four or five gifts that are listed there in verse number 11. I was talking to Jerry Jenkins after the service, and uh, he said, that was the best two sermons I've heard you preach in a while. Huh? If you were here last week, you know what he's talking about. But today, I want us to come back, and I want us to look at, as this list continues of those gifts there in chapter 4, verse 11, I'll tell you right up front, we're not going to be able to look at all three of those gifts today. I, I, I'm hoping that we can get at least through the first one, I'm going to try to get into the second one. Um, but really, I, I want to spend a little time here and just lay a foundation, and yes, pun intended, lay a foundation because that's what we're looking at, the, the prophets and the evangelists. Last time we looked at the apostles. We'll make some more reference to them even this morning. But I'm going to have to hurry just to get through the first of these that have to dealing with the prophets. So let's just read the, the passage. We'll read verse number 11. I want to read down just a little further just so that you can see some of the context here. And he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming, but speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. And this is the word of our Lord. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we bow our hearts before you, and we praise you and we bless you for the Lord Jesus Christ, for he is the head of the body. And it is he who has given gifts to the church, and we praise you and we bless you for your wisdom. And Lord, we pray that as we seek to understand the ministry of the prophets and the evangelists, and even looking forward as pastors and teachers, Lord, we pray that you would help us to understand this ministry that we might not only respond in awe, but in faith, knowing that you have supplied every need. And so I ask, Lord, for the ministry of the Holy Spirit this morning that you would teach us and grant us an understanding. We pray this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, this morning I want to talk a little bit about the ministry of prophets and the ministry of the evangelists. And that's the question, prophets and evangelists, are there any modern-day prophets and evangelists? And of course, generally speaking, both in the sense that there are prophets in the sense that one who speaks forth the revelatory word of God, that is the, the prophetic word, there are prophets in that sense. For example, uh, someone who says, thus says the word of the Lord. When I'm preaching the word, in that sense, it's prophetic. Uh, evangelist in the sense that uh, someone who evangelizes. But the question is, in context... Is that what Paul's talking about, or is he talking about certain offices that were 
prevalent for a season, or the question is, are they still prevalent today? You hear someone talk about being a prophet today. Is that true? Are there prophets? I was recalling that uh, some time ago that I had met with a group of pastors, and I used to meet with this group on a Thursday morning, almost 20 years ago. And there was a, there was a gentleman there uh, who was serving in a church, called himself a pastor. And uh, we were talking, we met on Thursday morning, and we were talking about what we were going to preach that Sunday. And the question came up and was asked of him, what are you going to preach on Sunday? And he said, I never know. I never know what I'm going to preach. He said, I just wait till I get to the pulpit, and then I just wait on the Lord. He said, I never know what I'm going to preach. I just, I just wait until the Lord gives me a word, and then I preach that word. What are we to make of that? I mean, when you think about the modern-day prophet, are there, are there prophets? Is God still giving prophets to the church? Is he still speaking uh, through visions and through revelation, through dreams? Well, let me suggest to you that He's not. Let me suggest to you that according to the Scriptures that we have been given the revelation of God's Word. In fact, I want to start with a little book. Uh, let's go back to the, the book of Jude for just a moment. And I want you to see this for yourself rather than me just reading it to you. It's just one verse. Jude is right there before Revelation, the last book of the New Testament. Only one chapter, so verse number three. It's a small book, but it's packed but in this, ver in this letter, as Jude is, is writing to the church, we see something here that he says that really, I think, helps us in understanding about the, the prophetic word that has been given to the church. Verse 3, he says, Beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, and by common salvation, he's just speaking of our salvation that we share, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. Now you read that and we think about faith subjectively, but really he's talking about faith objectively. He, he, in the original language, he's talking about the faith. There's a, there's a definite article there. He's talking about the faith that has once for all been handed down to the saints. What is the faith? He's talking about the, the doctrine. He's talking about the truth. He's talking about God's word, the gospel that has been handed down once and for all. You, you see something about Jude in this. That is Jude, he's, he's writing, and you see, uh, really... You see something about the, the revelation and the inspiration of, of Scripture. And we would say that God, in, in the revealed Word of God, that God reveals Himself, He reveals His truth uh, to His people. In this case, the apostle, as he's writing, Jude is writing. And the inspiration, he's writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is guiding him as he's writing these thoughts. He feels compelled to write this thing. And by the way, when, when, I say, when we talk about the inspiration of Scripture, and I don't want to make all of this about a, a message about how we got our Bible, although that would be probably a good thing to do at some point. But when you think about inspiration of Scripture, and you talk about the Holy Spirit, He uses these various personalities. That's why when you read the Scripture, it's not that God gives a message, that He, he reveals His truth, and like a robot, they just repeat that truth. Rather, we should understand that he, as, as the Holy Spirit gives the truth, he uses the personality of those individuals to communicate that truth. That's why the letters of Paul is different than the letter of John and even the letter of Jude, the letters of Peter. You see that. All that to say, the faith has been once and for all handed down. So we have the Word of God. The canon has been closed. God has given His truth. This has been hammered out 
And, and we believe, and church history bears this out, that God has spoken, and there's no need for further revelation. I'm interested because some people would think, well, you know, that would really be neat if, maybe, does anybody use the word neat anymore? I don't know, but cool, that's one of my words I like to use. Wouldn't it be excellent? I would just use, wouldn't, if, wouldn't it be, I can't even talk anymore, I'm trying, thinking too much. But wouldn't it be something if we could get a fresh word from God? And the idea, I think some people have this idea that that would really be a good thing. But I want to suggest to you that it is a better thing that we have the word of God. Because what we have, and God has spoken, we have his word that has been given to us once and for all. It's been handed down. These doctrines the teaching of God, Old Testament and New Testament. And so I don't have to go chasing after some sign or some miracle. I don't have to be driving down the highway and looking. If I could just see a rainbow here, I know what to do. No, I can go to the Word of God. And so, the, so in that way, do you understand that our position that we have the Word of God? Do you understand just how privileged that we are that we have access to the revealed Word of God, and that we believe in the sufficiency of Scripture. That that is to say that God has spoken, and so I don't have to chase some neon rainbow. I don't have to go out and, and look for some kind of sign somewhere. No, I can go to the Word of God and know that it is sufficient for all of my needs. It takes the guesswork out. And is everything specifically spelled out? Of course not. I mean, we, we, we know that how God speaks. We know that He's spoken and that the Scripture is sufficient. And so we ought to pray, and we know that the Holy Spirit helps us to understand the Word and apply it to us. If you're a believer in Christ, then you've been given the gospel, the truth, of God's Word, and you have been indwelt by the Holy Spirit, and you have access to the very throne room of God, and God Himself will guide you. So, going back to Ephesians, and let's go back to chapter 2. Going back to Ephesians, and we're going to talk just a moment about this office of prophet. What was the function? Why, why, why were there, why was there offices of prophets? And I say offices because as you look at Ephesians 4.11, you see that some were apostles and some were prophets, some were evangelists, some pastors and teachers. As he's talking about those gifts, he's talking about, I believe, those that had been given to the church, he's talking about offices. And, and I would say that that's where we emphasized last week that an apostle, in a very general way, is one who is sent. It is a sent one. But in a specific way, there were apostles that were in the first century. There were 12 of them. Those apostles, you remember that Judas hung himself. Judas died, and then he was replaced with Paul. At the time was Saul and became Paul. And, and you recall that it is Jesus who called those 12 apostles. So are there any modern day apostles in that biblical sense of that office? No. It was for that particular season, for that particular purpose. They had a purpose in the first century. Are there any more new prophets today? No. It was for that season, for that purpose. Well, what was the function of the prophets? And that's what we want to talk about just for a few moments. What, what's the function? What, why, did they, why were they there? And, and you see, looking at Ephesians chapter 2, and notice in there in verse number 19, you see something about the ministry of the prophets. Uh, he, Paul writes that then, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. There it is. 
So that tells us something about why there were apostles or, and why there were prophets in the first century is because they were there to lay the foundation of the church. The foundation is built on Christ being the chief cornerstone. Everything lines up in accordance with him. You know what a cornerstone is. And the prophets and the evangelists were that foundation, or prophets, should, I should say, and apostles were that foundation upon which the church has been laid. I know we're working on a uh, renovation project for our sanctuary, and it's taking forever. I mean, it's just, quite frankly, we started this last year, and we, I mean, just trying to get things done. We're meeting with some contractors this week, but I mean, it's been something that we have been working on for a period of time now, and, and hopefully we'll, before Jesus comes back, hopefully, hopefully we'll get it done. But, but we're doing this renovation project, but we don't have to go back and lay the foundation again because it's been laid. You lay the foundation one time. And that, that's what I want to emphasize about prophets and apostles, that that foundation has been laid one time, you don't have to go back and lay it again. It's there. It's, it's why it's called a foundation. And you build upon that, which is what we're doing. Jesus being the chief cornerstone. God gives revelation to the apostles and prophets. And in doing so, he's building the foundation of the church. And this is where we need to make just a, a distinction between the apostles and the prophets, I've already kind of alluded to the apostles that there were those 12 that were chosen by our Lord. And the prophets, and by the way, in Acts chapter 13 and verse 1, Paul is referred to as a prophet. Later on, we know him to be an apostle. He talks about that. Let me just say this, that all apostles were prophets. But all prophets were not apostles. All apostles were prophets. They spoke the prophetic word. They were given a revelation from God. They revealed that truth. They spoke that truth. But not all prophets were apostles. There were only 12. And yet God uses both of them to lay the foundation of the church. What is he doing? He's, laying, he's revealing truth to these apostles and prophets to lay the foundation of the church. And so we know, uh, like the scriptures, go to Ephesians chapter 3 for just a moment. As we, as we look at the scriptures, as God has revealed this truth to us, it tells us about how the house is to be built. Christ is the one who is the head of the church. Christ is the one who builds the church. He's not left us to not know how we're to operate. He's not left us to, to, to know how we're to live out the faith. He's given the word for, so for us to do so. In Ephesians chapter 3, we looked at this already, but Paul is, is talking about in verse 1 about being in prison, and he's a prisoner of Christ. He's in jail as he's writing this. Speaks about verse 2 of the stewardship of God's grace, which was given to me for you. Now, watch this that by revelation, there's a key word there, that by revelation there was made known to me the mystery. There's another key word. So, when we're talking about apostles and prophets, one of the keys that we're looking at for uh, these, there are three words really I would say that we should emphasize. One is revelation, one is mystery, and the other we'll come to in just a moment. Mystery is something that was hidden in the past, but now it's been revealed. This is what he tells us. It was made known to me the mystery, as I wrote before in brief. By referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed, there's revelation, he's been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. So it is through the Spirit that God has revealed these mysteries. Wisdom is the, is the, is the third word that I was referring to. 
God's wisdom is, is revealed, and it's revealed to the apostles and the prophets in the Spirit. And what was this? And specifically, he says that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ, in Christ Jesus through the gospel, of which I was made a minister. He goes on to talk about, even in verse number 10, the manifold wisdom. What was Paul talking about? Well, in the Old Testament times, it was not known that the Jews and Gentiles would be one in Christ, that they would come together as one people, that they would no longer be Jew or Gentile. But it was revealed to the prophets, and it was revealed to the apostles. And so we have the recorded word. We, we understand that there's no longer a distinction between Jew and Gentile, that we become one person in Christ, a, a, a new creation, a new man. And the prophets, just like the apostles, had the ability to speak this revelation that was from God. Yet, in thinking about the distinction between the apostles and the prophets, we need to make clear, as 1 Corinthians 12, 28 says, that there's a distinction, and there's a, a distinction, and there's an order. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, 28, that God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, and third teachers. So there was apostles, prophets, and teachers. Teachers are still functioning today. Pastors are still functioning today. Apostles and prophets no longer are functioning because they serve their purpose of laying the foundation. We have the revealed Word of God. Another distinction I would make between the apostles and the prophets is that the, the prophets were subject to the apostles, just like you see in that order in 1 Corinthians 12, 28, that first apostles and second prophets. You see this a little bit more clearly in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. If you want to go ahead and make your way there. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, we see Paul is giving instruction. We... we Spent some time in First and Second Corinthians, and if you remember, they were a messed up church. I mean, they, they had messed up a lot of things. People, I hear people all the time, you know, we want to go back and be like the first century church. Well, you don't want to be like Corinth. I, I can just tell you, I mean, Corinth, they, they, were, they were confused about how to use their gifts and speaking in tongues, and I mean, they were, they were abusing the gifts. And so Paul writes to them, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 29. Is there a modern application, modern day application? Yeah, yeah, there's modern day application. But he's speaking specifically to those prophets. Notice what he says in verse 29, let two or three prophets speak and let the others pass judgment. The others passing judgment, he's not talking about the church, but rather what he's talking about is the other prophets. So prophets are to be subject to prophets. Let the others pass judgment. But if a revelation is made to another who is seated, the first one must keep silent. For you can all prophesy one by one so that all may learn and may be exhorted. And the spirits of prophets are subject to prophets. See, he elaborates on that. For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. And so what he's telling us in this passage, Paul is saying that, Corinth, you're abusing these gifts... You've gotten um, where you're operating in a state of chaos. God is not the author of confusion. There needs to be order within the church. And he says, this is how prophets ought to function. So not only are prophets subject to prophets, but notice as Paul has given this instruction, prophets are subject to the apostles. So there's authority. There's an authority that takes place. Do you see that? Somebody saw it. So what, what I'm saying is, is that even in the first century that God had an order, there was a subjection there. So the apostles and then the prophets. And that's how Paul could tell them that. And it seems to be that what you see with the ministry in the New Testament is that 
the apostles had somewhat of a, a widespread ministry. They're, they're, they're going from different region to different region. Whereas it seems, and if you'll turn to Acts chapter 11 for a moment, that the prophets were more localized. That they actually functioned within the local church. In Acts chapter 11, we see firsthand a prophet. Acts chapter 11, verse 27. Now at this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them named Agabus stood up and began to indicate by the Spirit that there would certainly be a great famine all over the world. And this took place in the reign of Claudius. And in that proportion that any of the disciples had means, each of them determined to send a contribution for the relief of the brethren living in Judea. And thus they did, sending in charge of Barnabas and Saul to the elders. So so in other words, what you see in this, where, where we see the ministry of the apostles, for example, the apostle Paul, and he's writing about the mystery of Christ. And, and, and you see that Paul is addressing, while he's addressing a local church, he seems to be addressing the church universally. Whereas the prophets, it seems to be that God is preserving his church, protecting his church in the early first century. And he gives this word through a prophet. They go out and they take a a collection. We see that with the apostle Paul. He takes this collection for the people in Judea. It's interesting that when you think about prophets and you understand how God works, you go back to Deuteronomy, you don't see what God thinks about prophets. Then in Deuteronomy, he makes it very clear that that if someone is a false prophet, how do we know if they're a false prophet? If what they say does not come true. And what was to be done of the false prophet? They were to be put to death. Well, what if we did that today? I'm not suggesting we ought to do that today. I'm I'm just saying there is a way to put them to death, and one way to put them to death is not by giving anything to their ministry, which we ought not be doing anyway. But in the first century, they were dealing with false prophets, and that's why in 1 Corinthians 14, he's saying that the prophets ought to judge the prophets to see if they're telling the truth, and God uses those prophets to preserve his church. So the ministry of the apostles seems to be more globally, while the ministry of the prophet seems to be more regional to the local church. The last thing I would just mention, and I I say this because it's there, is that there were women that were prophets in the first century. Hello. There were women that were prophets in the first century. Even Philip the Evangelist, who we'll look at briefly in a moment, but Philip Remember, they had four daughters that were prophetess. In fact, if you look at Acts chapter 2, when the church is birthed on the day of Pentecost, that was one of the signs that the last days had come, the last days being ushered in with Jesus. One of the signs that the last days had come was that both the sons and the daughters would prophesy. We don't have time to look at all of this, but simply to say that they were there, they were women that were prophesying in the church. But, with the understanding, and Paul addresses this in that passage we looked at a moment ago in 1 Corinthians 14, that they were still subject to their husbands, and they were still subject to the leaders within the local church. In other words, what we see in accordance with Paul's teaching elsewhere Because Paul says very clearly in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 34, that the women are to keep silent in the church. And he's saying that in the context of prophets. Does that mean a woman cannot give an exhortation in a Sunday school class? No, that's not what it means. Does that mean that a woman cannot pray during prayer meeting? No, that's not not what it means. Does Does it mean that a woman can't give a testimony? No, that's not what it means. It means that a woman cannot prophesy. She cannot teach men. In accordance with what Paul says elsewhere. 
So there were women, and God used women to speak truth, but it was always within the order of the church that God had given. So I don't want you to see prophetess as someone like we see today that claims to be, you, 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 go to, you, you see these uh, men and women and they, you know, I'm pastor so-and-so, I'm prophet so-and-so, and this is my wife, she's a prophetess, and, and, and she speaks, and, and, and you would think sometimes she's pounding her fist, you'd think that she, she's, she's acting like a man, and you say, how does that line up with Scripture? Well, let me just say, it does, it does not line up with Scripture. It's not scriptural. Y'all doing all right this morning? And, and, and so, but I, I wanted you to see this, and, and like I said, we spent some extra time, and this is all about the prophets. But very quickly, I, I want us to look at the office of evangelists, and, I, and we're not going to spend a lot of time here, 30, 45 minutes, no, 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 we're just, just a few moments. But I want you to see this office of evangelist, because here, here's the question about evangelists. He, he, he mentions evangelists here. Will it surprise you? I mean, there's prophets all over the New Testament church. We, we see that in the scriptures that it speaks about prophets. But it would, would it surprise you that an evangelist is only mentioned three times, and one of them is there in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11? That the only time that we see the evangelist is actually in reference to Philip, who was called an evangelist in chapter 21 of of Acts, and then Timothy is told in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 5, to do the work of an evangelist. Three times. In fact, t- turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 5. And I, and I just want to do this and just just as you see this very familiar passage where he talks about preaching the word and in second timothy chapter 4 verse 1 paul tells timothy i solemnly charge you in the presence of god and of christ jesus who is to judge the living and the dead by his appearing in his kingdom preach the word be ready in season and out of season reprove rebuke exhort with great patience and instruction For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires. And they will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. Now Paul's talking to the church in the first century, but certainly this applies today, right? But you... Be sober in all things, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Now, I forgot to check because Brian Mullet preached on this passage not long ago. I forgot to check to see what he said about this. But typically, the way that this is approached is that most people will say, well, what he's telling uh, Timothy to do here." is as a pastor, he's telling Timothy to do the work of an evangelist. In other words, it speaks about a, a preaching the word, and, and, and you would go through what all that entails, but then doing the work of a, a, an evangelist, it would mean that you have a, a full ministry, that we're, we're not just shepherding, but we're also uh, evangelizing. But, and while that's where most people look at this, there are others who would say that that's not what it means. That he's not talking to Timothy as a pastor, but he's talking to Timothy as an evangelist. That Timothy's role is much different than the role that we see with pastors today. In other words, what what some people suggest, and, and I tend to agree with, is that do the work of an evangelist is what Timothy is called to do. That the fulfilling of his ministry is fulfilling the ministry of being an evangelist. In other words, what I, what, I, what I believe that this passage is referring to is that Timothy had the role of an evangelist. And here's why. 
Because when you look at the ministry of Timothy, it looks, uh, looks much different than the ministry of a pastor today. And I'm just going to stop right there. It makes, it, it's much different in the sense that Timothy goes beyond what we would see in the pastoral ministry of today. In fact, for example, in Philippians chapter 2, where, where Paul is talking about sending Timothy to the church at Philippi. He says, I hope to send him immediately. As soon as I see how things go with me, and, and I trust in the Lord that I, must, I myself also will come shortly. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 9 through 12, Paul says this about Timothy, that this is it's a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance. For it is this that we labor and strive because we have fixed our hope on the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially believers, prescribe and teach these things. Let no one look down on your youthfulness, but rather in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity, show yourself an example of those who believe. Until I come, give attention to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation and teaching. Do not neglect the spiritual gift within you, which was bestowed on you through prophetic utterance with the laying on of hands by the presbytery. Timothy seems to have a ministry, and I would say that perhaps Titus has the same kind of ministry that goes beyond being a pastor. Timothy goes, he, he, is, uh, he works alone beside Paul, and Paul sends him to various places. He sent him to Corinth. He sent him to Philippi. Paul sends Timothy, and he seems to assist the apostles just like the, 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 the prophets assisted the apostles. And we see the same thing with Titus, that Titus is told when he goes to Crete that he's to appoint elders. Now, that's not what we would see with a pastor. I, I'm, I'm not going to go to Holly Springs and begin to appoint elders in all the churches. So what I'm suggesting to you, and, and, and I don't have time to flesh all this out, but, but just to say this, that it seems to be that Timothy and Titus have a ministry that goes beyond what we see in pastoral ministry. That they seem to be doing the work of evangelists, which is to assist the apostles in the teaching instruction, sharing the gospel, and in putting things in order in the church. So in that way, I would say that the evangelist ministry as we think of it doesn't exist now hear me when i say that just like apostles there there are still those who are sent i think missionaries are those who are sent there are prophets in the sense that we speak the truth there are evangelists in the sense that there are those who share the gospel and have a particular gift to do so but when we think about evangelists typically what we think about is those guys who have a bunch of shiny suits and they go out with their polished servants and they go on the road and they preach. I ran into my pastor from my home church not long ago and, uh, and every time he sees me, he tells the same joke. He's been telling for 30 years. I mean, he tells me the same joke. He says, man, if I had your hair, I'd be an evangelist. He's bald, by the way. But he said, you know, but he, uh, but when you think about those, those evangelists, you know, they, and my hair's kind of getting, you know, a little bit long right now. I need a haircut. But, but you think about those, those, those evangelists, they got, they got that good hair and shiny suits and polished. And, and hear me when I say this. I, I do believe that God uses itinerant preaching today. I, I think there are certain men that are gifted to go, and they go from church to church, and God uses them. In fact, I came to faith through a man who was called an evangelist. He was preaching a revival. It was, he was preaching at my home church, and I came to faith in Christ through his preaching. And so, so in that way, I still believe that God uses that, but in the sense of what we see in the New Testament, 
it seems to be that it's a transitory role that God is using these evangelists to set these, appoint these elders and set these churches in order, that it seems to be he's transitioning and giving the authority to the local church where the pastors have been given the qualifications about how they're to, uh, who they're to be and how they're to operate that there are no more evangelists in that sense. Are there any qualifications for an apostle in the Scriptures? Are there any qualifications for a prophet in the Scripture? Are there any qualifications for an evangelist in the Scripture? No, there are qualifications, two offices, the pastor and the deacon. Which tells me one last thing is that God has vested his authority in his word in the local church. So if there are a a calling of missionaries, and if there are a calling of evangelists to be sent out, they're to be sent out through the local church. That's how God operates. That's what we'll look at next time as we begin to look at pastors and teachers. But while they're not, what I would say... In the strictest sense, evangelists, there is, all over the New Testament, the ministry of evangelism, which is what we're called to do. We're called to share the good news of Jesus Christ. We're we're called to to share that that God has sent His only begotten Son, that He lived a perfect and sinless life, and that he died as a substitute on our behalf, on behalf of all those who would trust and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. How do we know God accepted the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ? Because on the third day, he was raised from the dead. We think about the ministry of evangelism, typically what we think about is we measure that by how many baptisms. You think about how how many baptisms are going on in that church. Man, they're an evangelistic church. No, an evangelistic church is a church that is faithful to tell others about Jesus. That's it. Because our role in sharing the gospel is simply that, to share the gospel, to be faithful, to share the gospel. But it is God's role to bring about conversion. I, don't, I, I mean, my role is just to tell people how to be saved. It's God who tells them that they are saved. So what about you? Have you, by faith, trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, what does that mean? Understanding that you are sinful and that you have no relationship with God because you have been separated by your sin? Do you understand that? That Scripture makes it very clear? Even as Barry prayed earlier, that we are sinners by nature and sinners by choice? That you are separated by God, but God has made a way of reconciliation through His Son. He has sent His Son that you might be reconciled to God. And I'm standing here on behalf of God this morning saying, be reconciled to God. And you can do so through the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm saying, based on the authority of the Word of God, to repent and believe the gospel. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And He will save you from your sin. Will you stand with me for prayer this morning? You know, we talk about being saved from sin, and a lot of folks have an idea, maybe an idea about what that means, but but simply, what you need to be saved from is from the wrath of God. You think about sin, you, you compare yourself to another person. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm a sinful person. I'm not as bad as this person. But you need to understand that one sin separates you from God. And according to the Scripture, the wrath of God abides upon you. So if you remain in that state, 
then God in, would be just and right to eternally separate you from himself because he's holy. He is blameless. He never changes. And so it's just God being God, who he is. But God is also merciful. And he has provided salvation. Will you not today repent of your sin, turn away from your sin, and turn to God in faith? Father, we are grateful for the provision of our sin that you have made through your Son. That he who knew no sin became sin on our behalf that we might be called the righteousness of God in him. Lord, I pray that for those who even now are still in their sin and separated from you, that you would mercifully, mercifully reveal their condition that they might in faith and repentance turn to you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.